met with Jean-Pierre at the UN headquarters in New York City, where we discussed the challenges and rewards of global peacekeeping. Why don't we start with COVID, the pandemic? What were some of the things that you had to deal with as a result of the pandemic? I know you like to get out in the field. Obviously, that would be hamstrung there. Talk to us about what were some of the problems that you had to deal with as a result of COVID? Well, frankly, I mean, <clears throat> in the uh, first month of the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. And uh, I couldn't really tell with uh, you know, 100% certainty that uh, even our missions would be able to continue. But um, there was a lot of efforts made uh, by the system as a whole, the UN, and with the support of our member states, uh, to overcome the challenges uh, of COVID-19. We took a number of measures having to do with uh, um, suspending rotations of troops, and then we resumed those rotations, but uh, with a number of uh, additional measures such as quarantine, uh, we reorganized the way in which uh, things are done in the mission. And then later on, we started uh, with the vaccine and the support of our member states was uh, critical, including China, which committed uh, uh, an important number of doses to uh, helping that uh, effort at uh, you know, getting the vaccine, uh, making sure that it would be available to our peacekeepers. Um, in addition to that, uh, I think it's also important to highlight the fact that our peacekeepers helped the response of the local communities and the national governments of the countries in which we were deployed. And that, I think that was also very much appreciated. Today, we're in a better place, but uh, we're not uh, out of the wood when it comes to COVID-19. We kept in place a number of important measures. I mentioned the quarantine, uh, the uh, uh, social distancing uh, in the way in which our colleagues, at least those who are uh, in, uh, you know, working uh, from their office are doing things. Um, I think it's important to, and we keep conveying that message that uh, uh, to our peacekeepers in the field that uh, we, we need to continue to be very careful. And at the same time, we, we monitor the situation very uh, regularly. But I have to say that the situation um, is better now. Uh, but again, this was a massive effort uh, made by all of us in the field here at HQ and with the very strong support from our member states. Climate change. Climate uh, change. We've heard so much about climate refugees. I mean, all the kind of the ingredients there and how that can also create a volatile atmosphere. What are your concerns about climate change? Well, climate change, or rather the impact of climate change, is uh, clearly uh, a driver or an enhancer of conflict. That, that is absolutely clear. We see it in uh, uh, so many countries where we are deployed in the Sahel, uh, in South Sudan, in the, in, in the DRC. And, um, you know, even though our peacekeeping mission cannot address climate change in its globality, I mean, that's uh, a job of uh, uh, you know, COP26 and all these uh, very uh, critical efforts. But what we can do and what we seek to do is to help addressing the impact of climate change on conflict and conflictuality on the ground. Um, one example uh, of the efforts that we're making on the ground is uh, about uh, the tensions between farmer, farmer and farmers and herders that we, we, we see in, uh, in many of the countries in which we're deployed, particularly in Africa. Um, a number of our missions are working together with other partners, such as the World Bank and others, to um, implement projects that aim at deconflicting uh, these, uh, you know, the, 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 those communities. And, um, you know, one of the things that is uh, uh, often uh, uh, provided by these projects is uh, making sure that uh, as the season approaches where uh, there will be these movements of cattle, uh, then, you know, communities are brought together to discuss, you know, the routes and, uh, and, and, and the support that uh, will be provided in, you know, each step of the way. And, you know, as I say, making sure that it's deconflicted. I think there are a number of uh, other things that can be uh, made in relation to, uh, as I say, mitigating the impact of climate change on 
conflictuality. Uh, like I say, again, that doesn't address the, the, the global issue of climate change, but I think it's an important contribution uh, that we can make. And we're uh, trying to, to enhance and develop uh, the, such projects in the field. Jean-Pierre has more than 25 years of political and diplomatic experience. He's been with the UN since 2014. Before that, he was ambassador of France to Sweden. Currently, he oversees 13 active UN peacekeeping missions across three continents. You like to go visit these missions. Uh, is it because you like to go and provide strength for the people there out in the field? Or do they give you the strength to come back here and fight the fights that you have to fight in New York? Uh, the, I mean, definitely both. I think it's critically important to keep in touch with our colleagues in the field. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're at risk of being disconnected and not really knowing what the key challenges are in the field. But I also think it's important, as you indicated, to convey to them that uh, you know we are there to support them. We're, we're committed to supporting them. That's actually our main role is to, pour, to, to support our colleagues in the field. And you're also right when you, uh, when you suggest that uh, you know, their commitment and their energy and their dedication is also, uh, you know, provide a big boost to us and uh, sort of reinforces our determination to, 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 to help them and support them in their, uh, you know, critical actions. In 2018, the Secretary General launched Action for Peacekeeping. Um, can you explain what that is and, and, and how has it transformed things? Mm. Yes. Uh, the Action for Peacekeeping initiative uh, was uh, aimed at, uh, first of all, uh, being very candid with our member states as to what the key challenges of peacekeeping were and still are, and making sure that we would work on addressing these challenges collectively, because it's a shared responsibility. I think peacekeeping is the ultimate partnership between member states, the Secretariat, and, of course, the host governments. And um, we identified a number of key areas on which we needed to work. Actually, protection of uh, peacekeepers is one of the key priority areas, but there are others such as improving the number of women in peacekeeping or improving uh, the uh, level and the quality of equipment as well as training. Uh, we also worked a lot on assessing performance and making sure that based on these assessments, uh, we would uh, take necessary measures. So all of this has been the subject of many initiatives, many action. We are three and a half years after the launching of Action for Peacekeeping, and now uh, we have uh, taken stock of what has worked and indicated that uh, uh, as a result of our efforts, the number of peacekeeper killed as a result of hostile attacks have been decreased. I think we have a number of uh, other progress in, in various areas, but we decided that now is the time to take stock and revisit our priorities. In other words, identify the key areas on which more efforts need to be done. And that will be our implementation or new implementation plan for action for peacekeeping. We call it A4P plus over the next two years. Again, safety and security of our peacekeepers, definitely, definitely, again, continuing our efforts to improve the number of women in peacekeeping. But we want to put also more emphasis on improving communication. How do we communicate better? How do we counter fake news disinformation? How do our peacekeeping mission work in a more integrated manner? You know, the various components, the police, the military, the civilian, but also the humanitarian partners that are working with us. How can we be really working as one? So those are the few priorities on which uh, we hope that we can uh, make more efforts moving forward. And I would add another one, which to me is critically important. It's the enhancement of peacekeeping's use of new digital technology. We need to make the best use of these technologies. Can they can really help us on areas such as better protection, better communication, better planning, better collection of information and better processing of these information. So uh, we will also put uh, a lot of efforts into um, this, what we call the trans strategy for the digital transformation of peacekeeping. 
For more than 30 years, China's armed forces have participated in UN peacekeeping operations. It's contributed more than 50,000 personnel, 24 of them who've died while deployed. This year is the 50th anniversary of China uh, coming into the UN. Can you talk about their contributions to the peacekeeping efforts? Yes, uh, it's a very important uh, contribution, one uh, that is uh, visible on the ground because we have uh, more than 2,000 Chinese peacekeepers deployed in, uh, in many missions and uh, that makes China the 10th uh, biggest uh, contributor of peacekeepers on the ground. And they are all uh, very dedicated, very professional. So we really uh, uh, appreciate and we're very grateful for, for this uh, Chinese commitment to having uh, men and women in uniform in the field. And in addition to that, of course, there's a role of China in uh, being a, an important financial contributor, the second largest contributor to the budget of peacekeeping. But I, I think equally important is the support that we get to the efforts that I was mentioning uh, in regard to uh, A4P and now A4P plus support on the issues such as the protection of our civilians, where I mentioned the uh, resolution that was adopted by the Security Council, but also the support that we're getting from China on various efforts related to protection of peacekeepers. Uh, I also mentioned the uh, strategy for the digital transformation of peacekeeping and uh, uh, I'm also very appreciative of the fact that we will be, we are getting support from China to implement that strategy. And I could go on and name uh, a number of other priorities uh, on which we're getting the, uh, uh, a very strong commitment from China and very concrete support. And I think that is critically important because we count on our member states and certainly we count on those member states with uh, strong capacities and strong skill sets and expertise to help us deliver a better peacekeeping. So let me ask you this. Um, I think given any perspective, you're in a volatile environment, somebody parachutes in, they look different than me, they speak a different language than me. It's very easy to see that even though they are peacekeepers, to me, they may look like an occupying force, uh, which I know you're up against this a lot. How do you engage the local actors and get them more bought into what you're doing? Um, and is that an area for extra effort, would you say? Absolutely, moving yes. That's a very good uh, and a critical point, really. Um, I think uh, one of the key aspects is better communication and uh, including this uh, fight against misinformation and fake news, uh, uh, which has really become a threat to our peacekeeper and also to the population. I think the other critical aspect is engagement with the communities and how do we build trust with them. Of course, in addition to building trust with the host government, which by the way is a two-way street, we also need the host government to support us. Uh, our colleagues in the field are making a lot of effort to uh, be as close as possible to the communities, engage with them, um, meet with the uh, civil society groups and uh, groups that are representing the youth, the women, um, making sure that uh, we uh, understand their concerns and that we uh, understand the best way to address these concerns. Um, one uh, important aspect of having more women in peacekeeping is the fact that when we have more women in peacekeeping, then we are in a better position to build trust with the communities, including uh, women and children. Um, it's the presence that uh, uh, reassures and uh, convey a sense that uh, you know we're not there to fight a war, uh, we're not a threat, we're there to help the population. I uh, want to emphasize that uh, this is not the only benefit that I see in having more women peacekeeping, but it's clearly an important one. Since 1948, UN peacekeeping has made a real difference in places like Sierra Leone, Haiti, and Kosovo. But peacekeeping missions are constantly changing and becoming more demanding. What have been the changes you've seen through the years? Because you know, we're talking about digital disinformation. Mm -hmm. What's made your job harder? 
I think that's the uh, evolving complexity, the increased complexity in the uh, situation we're dealing with. I mean, the complexity of conflict, the complexity of, uh, uh, you know, the factors that we have to deal with. Uh, I mean, imagine COVID-19 that it comes on top of, uh, uh, you know, more sophisticated attacks against us. It comes, comes on top of this information, uh, which, you know, and fake news, which is something that we didn't have to deal with only uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So all the, uh, all this, you know, combined uh, is uh, really making uh, the job more challenging. For more than 70 years, the UN peacekeeping missions have supported political transitions, disarmed combatants, facilitated free and fair elections, and helped new countries such as Asia's Timor Leste come into being. What would the world look like if there were no UN peacekeepers? The peacekeeping operations are really playing a, an important preventative role. Um, you know, we have uh, in uh, all the uh, places where we deploy, uh, we have countless incidents. And, and in many cases, uh, these are incidents between two parties uh, or people affiliated to parties. Uh, um, and if we don't, uh, if our peacekeepers are not there to prevent those incidents from escalating, uh, that could easily uh, get out of control. And, and I believe that uh, uh, this preventive role of peacekeeping uh, must be emphasized because it's absolutely critical today, especially in a world that is uh, so uh, tense uh, today and, and uh, with conflictu conflictuality obviously on the rise. What more can be done? How do you go about uh, it's easy to just say, let's make it safer, more secure, but obviously these are volatile situations. I mean, what, what are steps that can be taken to actually minimize the risks? Well, first of all, uh, sensitizing our member states and sensitizing uh, those who can really help us. Um, I think the, uh, the resolution that was adopted uh, by the Security Council on the protection of peacekeepers, which was uh, an initiative by China, was hugely important in that regard because we need this uh, political engagement uh, at an important, at a high level. So that's one thing. Then the second thing is about um, improving the training, improving the preparedness, uh, improving the attention, the level of attention that is paid to threats against our peacekeepers. And then the third point is about equipment. We need uh, to be better equipped uh, to better cope with uh, IED attacks. We need to have our camps better protected and here digital technology and those new technologies that are out there can help a lot. We need to be more coordinated as well and more trained um, so that whenever these attacks occur, then we're better prepared. And finally, better medical support. That is critically important that we are making a lot of efforts in that regard. Jean-Pierre, thank you so much. Thank you.